Hi, welcome to this presentation on interpreting data. In this presentation, we'll talk about what it means to interpret data and also the key ideas of central tendency and variability when we're looking at data sets. The objectives here are to understand the difference between central tendency and variability, and also to understand why we have to discuss both of them in order to make sense of our data. Now, scientists go out and they ask questions about the natural world. Here's some examples. Uh, scientists could look at this scene and think about uh, factors that would determine biodiversity or how the introduction of fish into this pond might affect other organisms such as frogs. Then the scientist is going to collect some data. Uh, just like we did with the fire ecology study, we've collected a bunch of data and sometimes that's collected in notebooks or sometimes it's entered into a spreadsheet. But either way, it's just the raw information that we gather through some kind of scientific method. But then we have to figure out what that data means. What does it actually tell us? And when we just look at all those numbers, it's often not clear what kind of patterns or uh, processes are going on in the natural world that we're studying. So interpreting data just means to make sense of the data. Now, here's an example, an article about college graduates, and there were two different people looking at some information, some data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And depending on how they looked at it and how they interpreted it, they actually could come to different conclusions. So one actually came to the conclusion that too few people are graduating from college and that there will be a shortage of qualified people for uh, jobs in the next 10 years. The other person came to the conclusion that we had too many people graduating from college and that there will actually be too many college graduates who won't be able to find employment. So in interpreting the data, we're looking at the various numbers, we're looking at the evidence and trying to figure out what it means. And sometimes there's multiple ways of uh, thinking about what it means. So we make sense of this data by using tools such as graphs, data tables, and statistics. Now graphs and data tables are a way to display the information and you'll be asked to do that in the uh, experiments we're doing in biology. There are some resources in the biology shared folder about graphs in particular that can help you. Uh, statistics is basically taking that data and manipulating it or analyzing it in a way to see what it means. So this could be anything from averages to more advanced kind of statistics uh, such as chi-square tests or uh, t-tests. For us, we're going to look at two separate concepts. One is central tendency in statistics and one is what's called variability. And what central tendency and vari variability mean are just two ways of looking at the range of values in a data set. So here's a picture of a whole bunch of celebrities, and you can see it's got their height. So if we look on the far left side, we see Snooki there at four foot nine, and then on the far right side, we have Hulk Hogan at six foot seven. So not all the celebrities are the same height, but if we were to say on average, how, how tall the celebrities are. It would be somewhere right in the middle there around Justin Bieber, maybe about five foot six or right where Tom Cruise is there uh, next to him. So that would be the central tendency in this case or average value of the data. Somewhere around, we could say celebrities are on average about five foot six or five foot seven. But that doesn't tell us the whole story because if we say celebrities are five foot six on average, then we still might wonder, well, are most of them about five foot six, or are they really spread out in terms of their height? And when we look at this, this little chart here, right, we see that they're fairly spread out all the way down to four foot nine and all the way up to six foot seven. So we have quite a bit of what's called variability in this data set. The data points aren't all clustered around the average value, but rather they're more spread out. Variability basically gives us an idea of how confident we can be about the pattern we observe in our data. So here's a, here's a best fit line graph, and you can see a whole bunch of points uh, charted out on there. Some of the, this is for looking at the number of saves that a team has in baseball compared to their uh, record, how many games they are, about 500. And so what they were doing is trying to see if there was a relationship. And so they plotted out all these data points, and they created a best fit line, 
And then they can look at the slope of that line. You can see down below it has the equation, uh, function of x equals 0.21x plus 40.32. So the slope is 0.21. And it also calculated what's called an r squared value. The r squared value tells us how closely those data points fit to the line. And in this case, it's 0 0.46. Now the maximum would be 1. Uh, 1 would mean that the points fit exactly on the line, and the minimum would be 0, which means the points are just completely random. So in this case, at 0.46, uh, that gives us an idea of the variability in the data set. How well do the data fit with our sort of average value or with our best fit line? In this case, it's not very good. It's below 0.5. Uh, so even though there is a slight trend in the data, uh, it actually we can't actually be very confident that that line really describes the relationship. There are probably other factors that affect the number of saves other than games above 500. Here's another graph which shows uh, us some information about uninsured uh, people, adults, in King County, which is in Washington. And you can see they've broken it down by different income levels. So at the highest income level, over on the right side, $75,000 a year or more, only 2.6% of the people on average uh, have are uninsured, whereas at the lowest income levels, those numbers are much higher, 396 and 430 now they've also included what's called error bars on this bar graph, and error bars use measurements of variability such as standard error or standard deviation, and they give us an idea of how much higher or lower from the average uh, we could expect to find most people in this data set. So if we have a really large amount of variability in the data set, those error bars are going to be very large, and if we have less variability, they'll be really small. So you can see on the right again, that 2.6% for $75,000 or more a year, there's a really small error bar. That means that, that we can be very confident in that average of 2.6%. Over on the left side, the error bars are a little bit larger, and in fact, they overlap. So we see the one uh, that says 43.0. That bar is a little bit taller than the 39.6. So we might think that, on average, there are more people in the $15,000 to $24,999 range who are uninsured. But really the data don't suggest that because those error bars overlap significantly, meaning that really they're probably about the same. They could be exactly the same. In fact, it's even possible that the trend is reversed and that more people in the $15, less than $15,000 category are uninsured. Uh, than in the other category. We don't really know. So variability, because there's variability in those data sets, we can't be confident in just that single uh, average number. Median can also give us an idea about how confident we can be the average, uh, but we'll talk about that later. So in terms of statistical measures, we can think about how do we measure these quantity, how do we measure these ideas of central tendency and variability? And for central tendency, you can see uh, the three sort of most typical ones are mean, median, and mode. Mean and median in particular are useful for the studies that we're doing. Uh, variability then can be measured using just the range of data. So for example, with our celebrities, we would say four foot nine to six foot seven. But that actually is not a really great measure of variability in most cases. Uh, more importantly, we can look at either the R squared, uh, which I showed the example of, or uh, look at measures such as standard error and standard deviation to create error bars on our graphs. So we use our interpretations of data then as evidence to support a claim. The reason we look at the data and we do all that, that work to create graphs and data tables and to analyze the data using statistics is so that we can make a claim about how the natural world works. Here's an example. It says the introduction of fish to the lake has resulted in a significant decrease in the frog population. That's what I'm claiming. That's what I'm saying is true about the world based on my data. And then I'm giving the evidence that I have to back up that claim. In this case, it says the population density of frogs in the lake following the introduction of fish. And then I'm giving the average as x equals 3.3 plus or minus 0 0.8 frogs per meter squared. That's minus zero, that plus or minus 0 0.8 is my standard error in this case, is 48% less than the population density prior to introduction, 6.3 plus or minus 1.1 frogs per meter squared, and 37% less than the control lake where no fish were introduced, 
during this time period. So you can see I'm backing up my claim with evidence and I'm citing the specific evidence I have from my statistics. I could also reference the graph. I could reference outliers, which are data points that don't fit with the main trend. Uh, anything in my actual data that would support my claim and I want to be as specific as possible when I do that. A claim then is just an answer to a scientific question based on the data and the claim identifies the relationship between the variables. It doesn't necessarily explain that relationship uh, and, it, and the claim itself doesn't have the evidence piece. It just says what the relationship is. It answers the question we're asking. Evidence then is our information from graphs and statistics about, uh, about the claim to back that up. So when we look at evidence and interpret evidence, we say what is the evidence, what does it mean, and why is it important? So hopefully you got some insight into our two objectives with interpreting data, which is to understand the difference between central tendency and variability, and also to start thinking about why you have to discuss both of them when you look at a data set. I hope this is helpful.